Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is episode 7. In a break from the ongoing series on Irish history, this episode is going to look at St. Patrick, who is without doubt the most famous Irish historical figure. 1500 years after his death, he is seen as symbolic of the Christianisation of Ireland. But the real story behind this son of a Roman snatched by Gaelic pirates and sold into slavery, is lost in modern myths of snakes and shamrocks. In this episode of the Irish History Podcast, we'll delve deep into the declining Roman Empire and early medieval Ireland to see who St. Patrick really was and how Ireland was Christianised. Patrick today symbolises the conversion of Ireland from paganism to Christianity. However, the story of Ireland's conversion is far more interesting than the life of just one man. In popular history today, St. Patrick has come to symbolise what was the work of several generations of Christian missionaries and early converts. And any story of St. Patrick must include these early converts. Indeed, he himself was not even the first Christian missionary to Ireland. And to understand Patrick, we must understand Ireland's earliest Christians. By the early 5th century, a full generation before St. Patrick ever set foot in Ireland, the church authorities in Rome decided to send a bishop to serve Ireland's existing Christian population. In the year 432, a bishop called Palladius was selected for the task, but for him, this must have been a nightmare job. The Romans had long seen Ireland as a wild barbarian outpost, so the idea of leaving the comforts of Rome and beginning a long, arduous journey north through a Roman world that was increasingly starting to fall apart must have been pretty frightening for Palladius. However, through 432, he journeyed north, making his way to the western coast of Roman provinces in Britain, edging ever closer to what many must have seemed was a death sentence. Ireland, after all, was a source of ruthless raiders and pirates that were increasingly attacking Roman provinces in Britain. The Bishop Palladius did make it to Ireland and found the existing Christian community. This is one of the things that I find fascinating about the medieval period. It's just how Palladius could have found Ireland's Christians. With no telephone or postal service, you have to wonder how basic contact like this happened. The island that Palladius arrived in was a world apart from the Rome he had left. There was no central government of any kind. There was about 150 small kingdoms, each with their own power structure. There were no towns to speak of. Indeed, the main centres in the landscape were the very things Palladius had come to destroy, that is, pagan ritual sites. The lack of centralisation would make conversion of Ireland to Christianity very difficult, as the Christian church on the continent leant very heavily on the highly centralised Roman political system. To make matters worse... Travel and communication in early medieval Ireland was immensely difficult, with few roads across a landscape heavily covered in dense deciduous forests. It's little surprise that a man who could not speak the language, in a world he must have found completely alien, failed in any attempt to expand the existing Christian community. The Book of Armagh, a few centuries later, recorded rather disparagingly of his mission, Neither did the fierce and cruel men receive his doctrine readily, nor did he himself wish to spend time in a strange land, but return to him who sent him. As Palladius returned to him who sent him, he must have thought that Ireland was destined to continue as a pagan outpost. But next we'll see how those same fierce and cruel men would unknowingly aid Ireland's conversion when the man who had become St. Patrick was forcibly brought to Ireland. Through the 5th century, Roman power across Europe 
declined. Indeed, in the year 410, the Roman military had withdrawn from the provinces in Britain. Protection from raids from pirates based on the Irish east coast was now non-existent, and sometime in the mid-5th century, one such raid landed on the coast of Western Britain. In the following attack, the raiders targeted the now lost settlement of Banovan Tabernier, attacking the villa of a local Roman official, a man called Calpurnius. They grabbed his 15-year-old son, and while to the raiders this young man was a valuable slave, to history this 15-year-old was the teenager who would become known as St. Patrick. We know an awful lot about him because he would later in his life write an account called Confessio, which gives us a unique insight into his life. I'm going to put that on the website irishhistorypodcast.ie if you want to check it out. Now for captives like Patrick, their lives had taken a horrific turn, with a miserable existence as a slave in Ireland awaiting them. After surviving a horrific Irish sea crossing in what would have been a tiny open boat, he was destined to be traded as a slave. Presumably, after being sold at some slave market or fair, he embarked on a terrifying journey that so many other slaves before him had done, not knowing where he was going, unable to understand the language of his new masters. We don't know for certain where he ended up, and although many places claim to be the site of Patrick's captivity, there's no historical evidence to support any claim of a specific location. It's most likely he was taken north, as it seems it was to this area he would return later in life as a missionary. Now, as you can imagine, his life as a slave was incredibly difficult. Later in life, he would recall that he had to stay out in the forests and on the mountain, and I would wake up before daylight to pray in the snow, in icy coldness, in rain. When he had been captured... It seems that Patrick was not devout, but it was during his captivity in Ireland his faith grew. As he said himself in the work The Confessio, more and more did the love of God and my fear of him and faith increased. His increased Christian beliefs seem to have been the motivating factor for escaping, and after spending six years as a slave in Ireland, he claimed God appeared to him in a vision to escape. After what was an incredible journey, he did manage to return to Roman Britain. It's at this point where the life of St. Patrick becomes increasingly controversial. Later in his life, when he wrote a sort of biography that I've mentioned already, the Confessio, he said that he trained as a priest after his return, and then in a dream he was asked by the people of Ireland to return and preach about Christianity. Being slightly sceptical myself, I think it's highly likely that after Patrick trained as a priest, he was chosen to return to Ireland by the church to preach in a region where he understood the language and the culture. For whichever reason it was, it was in the later 5th century that Patrick found himself returning to the island he had spent six years of his youth as a slave. This time, however, he had come as a Christian missionary. The prospects can't have been great. He himself would have been aware of the experience of Palladius a generation beforehand. Patrick, however, had one major advantage over Palladius. He could speak the language and understood the pre-existing spiritual beliefs. Indeed, as we'll see later, early Christians, like Patrick, would adopt many pagan concepts to make Christianity more accessible to pagans. The facts about his life in Ireland as a missionary are scant, and after his death, many myths were created about his time in Ireland. Perhaps the greatest myth being the idea that Patrick himself converted Ireland to Christianity. This is not just untrue, but was actually impossible for one individual to do. When he arrived in the 5th century, as I've said, there was about 150 kingdoms, with a population of about half a million people spread across the island, of whom only a tiny minority were Christian. It would have been well beyond the capability 
of one individual to cover this territory. It seems most likely he focused on the north of the country, probably the areas he knew from his days as a slave. Most places that claim associations with Patrick do lie in the northern half of Ireland, while the next generation of preachers who followed in the footsteps of Patrick predominantly focused on the northern part of Ireland. Unlike later myths about his life, it seems that Patrick wasn't welcomed everywhere he went. Indeed, from his own testimony, the Confessio, it seems that, if anything, the opposite was true. He himself said that he lived in daily fear, expecting murder, treachery or captivity, and on at least one occasion he was fettered in irons. It was in this climate that Patrick seems to have adopted an approach of focusing, in part, on royal families. In the Confessio he points out that he had converted the children of royalty, along with many slaves. Converting royalty and nobility obviously made the job of any preacher in Ireland far easier. If he had the permission of kings to preach, he was far less likely to be attacked. There's much about the man's life we just don't understand. For example, for some unknown reason, he had many enemies within the church in England. He was accused of corruption later in life. Fortunately for us, it was in a response to this charge of corruption, he wrote the text, the Confessio, a defence of his life that does serve as an autobiography of sorts. It is one of the few reliable sources of his life, without which it would almost be impossible to decipher fact from myth. When he died sometime in the year 492 or 493, Ireland was not a Christian country. This would take at least another century. But for Patrick, he had made some successes. Indeed, he was probably the most successful early Christian missionary. But he wasn't the only one. Others included St. Ciaran, St. Alton and St. Secundus. It was in death, though, that Patrick's status reached epic proportions, becoming the figure we know today. Next, we'll take a look at the myths that emerged around St. Patrick. It was in the late 7th century that some of the stories we know about St. Patrick began to emerge. Around this time, a simplified history of Ireland's conversion to Christianity was being constructed. In this new narrative, other missionaries were increasingly relegated from the picture, while Patrick was attributed to converting the Irish largely on his own, while also carrying out many miracles. In general, he became a larger-than-life character, no longer representing one person, but indeed the conversion of an entire people. It was in the creation of this myth and story of St. Patrick that the symbols we most associate with him were added. This is, of course, the story of snakes and shamrocks. These were largely related to the battle in early medieval Ireland between Christianity and paganism. One of the most famous stories about St. Patrick is that he drove the snakes from Ireland. However, this was never meant to be taken literally. This was more an attempt by early Christians in the centuries after Patrick to parallel paganism with the snake, the Christian symbol of the devil. The most famous symbol of St. Patrick is undoubtedly the shamrock, which has since become one of the national symbols of Ireland. In the early medieval world, Christians would claim that he had used the three-leaved shamrock to explain the concept of the Holy Trinity. But again, this symbol was more about the struggle between Christianity and paganism than any attempt to explain the intricacies of the Holy Trinity. It's highly unlikely that Patrick himself ever used the shamrock. He never mentioned it in any of his own works. The shamrock traditionally was an important symbol in pagan society and it was just one of the many pagan symbols adopted by early Christians in Ireland to assist the conversion process. It's easy to see how a 7th century monk decided to Christianise the symbol of the shamrock by associating it with the increasingly popular and mythical figure St. Patrick was becoming. After co-opting some aspects of the pagan religion and using their symbols, Christianity began to edge out paganism in the late 6th century. It was between the 7th and 9th centuries that Christianity in Ireland would flourish in what has been called the Golden Age of Irish Christianity. Indeed, in an ironic twist, it would be monks whose ancestors had been converted by Patrick 
who would end up leading the reconversion of Patrick's homeland, which had reverted to paganism after an Anglo-Saxon invasion. In episode 8, we will return to the story of Irish history, picking up in the year 944, when a civil war breaks out in Ireland's most powerful kingdom. Finally, don't forget to contact me if you're interested in coming on the tour of Gaelic and Viking Dublin. You can email me at history at irishhistorypodcast.ie or contact me through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash irishhistorypodcast. Until next time, slong. Slong.